Welcome to the Queen Trail Podcast. Meditation doesn't have to be sitting still and having an empty mind. The journey is such a beautiful thing because we are all on a journey. You want to make sure you have some kind of distribution plan, at least have an idea of it, because you can make this really amazing film and it only gets seen by your family and friends. Old Hollywood is still intact. Every horse runs hard, but when they win, and they know it. They've got this little sass about them. It was pretty rough. I had to go into the water and with my med pack, swim to the beach, treat these guys, put them on my back, swim out to the helo. And I'm like, oh my God, I've never seen those before. And I said, what are those? And before I could even finish the sentence, she said, oh my God, you didn't touch them, did you? Even if monarchs go away and we never see one again, because there never will be monarchs again, if they die out, it is just a little indicator of larger threats Man. My dad said, so what were you guys doing in the desert? And I said, we were taking nude photos. <laughs> hey everybody, welcome back. I hope you had a great week since the last time that we got together, as well as a wonderful Thanksgiving. I just got back from Ojai and Thanksgiving there is one of my favorite holidays. We always have so much fun chasing chickens and picking fruit and just for the record, we do not eat the chickens. I just get a picture with the chickens every year. And if you've ever tried to catch a chicken, you know why I say chasing them, because they are so squirrely. In fact, this year I ended up in the hen house. I thought, well, if I'm in an enclosed place where they don't have a lot of mobility. It's a pretty big hen house, but they're not going to be running out in the yard and getting under bushes and that sort of thing. It'll be easier to catch them. And it was specifically for that reason, but it was still a little bit of a workout. And the funny thing is afterwards, I decided I'm going to look up how to catch a chicken. All these years, I'm like running up and down this yard, trying to get these things for like 45 minutes before I can get my picture. So let me see how the experts do this. And it's hilarious because every single video that I watched, everybody says, I'm going to try to catch a chicken and show you how it's done. And then they get a good workout doing it. I guess the thing that I learned, especially this time is one, go into the hen house if you can, if it's big enough. And then you just have to be patient. Toss some bird feed out for them because... They're going to look at you and they're going to be like, I don't want to get caught, but there's food on the ground. And so they're going to run after the food. And then you can quickly but gently hug the oldest one because the younger ones just are like, nope, I'm going to get my food and you're not going to catch me. (laughs) So we just have so much fun doing that, picking oranges, cooking, catching up with family. And it's just beautiful in Ojai. Uh, It's just a place to slow down and revive. So it was really wonderful, but I did eat two much. I think just like everybody else. So I started thinking there is a whole month off between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And that's going to be my set time period. I mean, it's nice because it is a beginning and it has a very distinct end if things don't work out. That's motivational in itself because you can see the light at the end of the tunnel before you've even started on your diet. Diets aren't fun, but I thought I'm going to try a diet that I've never tried before, which is a ketogenic diet. I've been doing some research on it. I've never tried it before because the idea to me of having a fat heavy diet is incongruous with the way that I think about food. And as I've said several times before, I'm a former fitness nutrition coach. And it's just kind of like, you know, fat is like, stay away from me that I don't want that in my body. So you're thinking, you know, the, the less fat I put into my body, the fitter I'll be. I don't know that that's necessarily true. After all of this research, I don't know that it's necessarily wrong either. But what I do know is this is a diet that I haven't tried. And so I'm going to give it a shot for four weeks. And I thought I'd put that out there just in case anybody that's listening is feeling guilty about eating 
too much at Thanksgiving and thinking about doing something to get eating habits back on track. You don't have to do a keto diet, but I wanted to put it out there. Just a little bit of a motivation. You've got four weeks and whatever it is that you do, maybe you want to diet along with me starting today or, you know, depending on what time you're listening to this, maybe starting in the morning. Do a little research about the diet that you want to do. Throw a little bit of exercise in there and we're going to be looking fabulous by Christmas. Anyway, enough of that. I want to get back to the podcast. Today, we're going to be hearing the second part of my conversation with my friend Phil Warren, who's a senior engineer in research and development. He's also a color specialist and encoder, just like a super techie guy. But on top of that, I mean, he's incredibly interesting and has some really fascinating stories. He's a world traveler an adventurer, and most recently, he became the headmaster of an unaccredited university, which we'll talk about in this episode, along with some out of this world, literally, adventures. So you don't want to miss any of them. Please grab a cuppa and join Phil and me in this In the Company of Friends talk. Enjoy. (laughs) So, I wanted to get away from animals for a minute and go into outer space. You covered one of the world's largest UFO conferences, which was Contact in the Desert. Yes, indeed. How did that come about? And, um, you know, just tell me about it. That sounds so interesting. Oh, my God. It was was one of my favorite weekends of my adult life. Um, This is first and foremost, very important to understand that this isn't actually a thing I believe in. Um, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about UFOs. I'm sure there's stuff that is flying that is unidentified. That's super interesting. The question of what is that is a great question. But the instant that someone supplies an answer that is aliens, suddenly it's, it's not really a question or unidentified anymore. It just becomes conspiracy. Not to universally denigrate a a school of thought, but this all tended to be people of a certain age range. I don't know what the attendance was, but it seemed like thousands of people at this convention going to panels, uh, largely fueled by the Ancient Aliens television show and the phenomenon of playing that on the History Channel for some reason. But (laughs) I... I was working with, well, I'd been asked by the woman who threw the event to come do event photography. So I supplied her with all the photos I took. And my connection to that was a group called the LA Metaphysical Library, a group that uh, provided, we'll say, fringe uh, belief structures to LA at large. They're big fans of exploring the esoteric, so they take me with them on a quite a few adventures. And in turn, I also brought uh, my best friend to this, who's an engineer, absolutely does not believe in this, but he's also a furry. And he agreed that the only way he would be willing to do this is if he could wear his fursuit the entire time. (laughs) So I show up to photograph every piece of this event, meet everyone that I can. And next to me is a seven foot tall, bright red reindeer named Bucky. (laughs) (laughs) Who had. You can't make this stuff up. This is hilarious. Oh my God. Bucky had not only no cause to be there. Uh, Because this is not related to aliens or UFOs, but no one at this festival had heard of the furry movement, which, if you're not familiar, is a, if not fetishistic, fetish-adjacent pursuit where uh, consenting adults dress up as furry animals and present with an alternate persona known as a fursona. And uh, (laughs) for some, that goes to a very sexual place. Uh, and to a lay person, to a bystander such as myself, it's hilarious. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, if you don't think of it in the fetishistic realm, it's also kind of adorable. So I saw a lot of alien enthusiasts give this man hugs, and it was, quite frankly, really heartwarming. 
Um, <laughs> but big smiles we went, and yeah, yeah. We went to some some very long lectures. Uh, we went to this alien bounty hunters lecture, and he allegedly has the world's largest collection of recovered alien implants, and. This guy did a a lecture on how to surgically remove alien implants, and it hit us about halfway through that this guy wasn't a licensed surgeon. Mm -hmm. Uh, We were definitely just watching a man talk about how to do unlicensed surgery. Oh, my God. I don't don't trust that what he was pulling out of people was was implanted by aliens. I don't know if this guy should be uh, doing surgery. It was really fascinating. Wow. And did, did he brought his collection with him? He did. And they, uh, they didn't look like anything. They were like little pellets and stuff. There weren't like <sighs> any bleepy bloopy microchips or, or it was all stuff that maybe could have happened organically or was just like buckshot from a hunting accident. It was, it was uh, odd. But what do and- I know? Yeah, so you would think that there would be some really interesting shapes to them, but he nope. removed them because what is the connection? Like, what exactly? Why are these implants in people? Uh, you know, the, he he spun quite a narrative with a lot of misspelled PowerPoint slides, but it, it <laughs> generally it seemed like people came to him and expressed that they'd undergone some sort of alien-focused trauma. Uh, and, and who am I to say they hadn't, but that was the one unifying element of almost everyone I spoke to at this thing. Their experiences seem to be traumatic and real. A lot of these people experienced something that was terrible and at some point were given the explanation by someone, or maybe they arrived at the conclusion themselves that aliens were responsible. Um, and all too often it seemed like it was probably some form of abuse one way or another that was mischaracterized mm. often under hypnotherapy, which was something that scared me quite a bit. And again, mm. I, I, I guess as a skeptic, I shouldn't be so quick to discount that it was aliens, but Occam's razor suggests that it probably was something more human and malicious. Um, but yeah, so this guy would be Uh, contacted by trauma survivors and asked to do whatever it is he does it was uh it was it was a lot and then on that note um the woman who ran contact in the desert also did ask me to photograph and cover the alien abductee support group so for that my friend did not wear his fursuit but me and him went to the support group and it was structured very similarly to any support group, really, Alcoholics Anonymous, NA, uh, people sat in a circle and discussed their trauma. It was very tearful. And it was, you know, while while the rest of the the conference was very easy to make light of, this was a very serious thing. And there were a few uh, cancer survivors who described being greeted by angelic hosts, because apparently Christian concepts of angels does fit within the realm of ufo enthusiasts i suppose Mm. um so that was fascinating um and it taught me a lot about trying to be sensitive to alternative explanations of trauma but i I really would have loved to have seen that diagnosis be able to be used in a more constructive fashion because once you talk to someone who's a trauma survivor and convince them that this trauma was caused by aliens there's no solvency in that. I, I guess maybe that allows you to compartmentalize and move on, but you are now presented with this narrative that the trauma you survived, the, the problem you have, is always out there. The, like, those are still up in the sky somewhere. There's no resolution to it. Yeah, and that's scary and sad, and I really wanted to hug a lot of people. Yeah. But for some of them, there was hope and beauty in it. For the cancer survivors who are greeted by angelic hosts, that's a very optimistic thing. They have a literal angel now looking out for them, and they know it because they met them. And that's that's neat. That is. You know, and angels, if you read enough accounts of angels, 
they could be aliens, especially when you've got angels who have zero empathy. They're completely unempathetic and just, sorry, it's your time to go. And your time to go requires me to crush you type of thing. And some of them are really scary. So I could see where there's that crossover of yeah. an angel being an alien. Um, were there any good, aside from the angels, any good abduction stories? Like, I'm really glad that I got taken into outer space. Or were they all traumatic, horrible, torturous well, experience? There were a few few and it was it was a, a lot of information to take in so i'm hoping i correctly parsed and remembered everything but i was furiously taking notes every night um i met more than a few and there, there were a few people at the abductee support group that believed themselves to be carrying babies that were human alien hybrids and they've been impregnated by aliens and they were very happy with this so that was interesting. I, I don't know what to make of that, but uh, were they all women? Yeah, yeah. And they I were pregnant. Know. Yes, yeah. I assume at some point in the birthing process, it's going to be revealed that it is in fact a human baby. Mm-hmm. And boy, will their face be red? I suppose. <laughs> and then you know when they turn two, three, and four, and those terrible twos, threes, and fours come around, they're like, "See, I told you, it's an alien." <laughs> questions will be erased again yeah (laughs) wow that's so interesting and you just finished writing an article too on was it rubles castle and the zorthian ranch yes uh so i write for uh, the metaphysical la library at times uh at least i am doing so for their upcoming publication don't know if their website has been launched yet, but the website is metaphysical.la, and they have a magazine that's going to be launched soon. I just uh, went with them to the Rubel Castle, which is a a five-story medieval castle constructed out of cement and junk. There's motorcycle parts, cash register bits, ceramic pieces of telephone poles, and all this stuff just cemented into the walls of what well, had started out as a two-story empty reservoir and is now a full-scale castle. It's incredible. It took almost 20 years to make, and the garbage artist, I guess it's called uh, Upcycled Art, mm-hmm. uh, he unfortunately passed away, and it has been handed off to the Glendora Historical Society and somewhat museumized which is bittersweet, almost melancholic, because this was a blooming, buzzing artist commune. Like, artists from all over Southern California would come and help uh, Michael Rubel build this castle. And then they'd stay, and they'd paint, and they'd create, and they'd help farm on this land. And it was a very vivacious living community. And now it's stepping into a form of preservation that is cool in some ways you can go see this castle but is it what the rubels would have wanted that's tough to say um the builder michael rubel his nephew scott still gives tours uh at the behest of the historical society and that was pretty neat and the rubels were also friends with this family in altadena known as the zorthians and i went to the zorthian ranch yesterday Zorthian Ranch, very similar, functionally garbage artists, uh, talented architects and artisans built these wild undulating structures in this ranch in Altadena, very similar to the Rubel Castle. And it's engaging. They just set up an art gallery, I want to say two weeks ago, dedicated to the now deceased Gerard Zorthian. Mm -hmm. And they've been giving tours the last two days. So they sound enormous. Is every wall and every fence, every piece of these structures recycled material? Every single bit. I know uh, Gerard Zorthian collected a lot of material from the Pasadena Department of 
modern power. So he used a lot of telephone poles and telephone pole pieces. Mm. Um, whereas Michael Rubel kind of just used whatever he could get anywhere. At one point, he even got a truckload of gravestone misprints. So wow. they, they have a, a graveyard at the Rubel Castle. There's no bodies. No one's ever been buried there. And it's just a site for grave errors. So it's kind of a pun. And that's it. <laughs> that is fascinating. Um, yeah, I've seen a couple of places like that. You know, well, apparently LA has a lot of them. The Watts Towers, Simon Rodea yeah. built that from tile and bottles and metal, I think, are the three main yeah. components of that. And when I was out in El Paso, there's a place called the Casa de Azúcar, which is the sugar house. And that was built from, I think it was mostly this man built this home for his wife. And, and so a lot of it is cement, but there are some recycled tiles and that sort of thing in there. And there, it's always so fascinating to see that because I can't build a structure you know, well, for, <laughs> to save my life. And I'm always just so fascinated by the ingenuity behind taking trash and turning it into a dwelling that people want to come and see and are impressed by. It's so fascinating because a lot of these artists, while very, very talented, uh, are, are not actually architects. So I know Gerard Zorthian had spent four or five years constructing a 40-foot tall retaining wall that showcased his art and would also retain the side of this canyon. And his son had tried to tell him, his son, who is an architect, Alan Zorthian, had tried to tell him, hey, dad, you need to put some footing down there. That's what retaining walls, even small ones, require. And his dad had kind of shut him down and explain that I've been doing this for 40 years. You don't, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm the artist here. And mm -hmm. during a particularly heavy rainstorm, the retaining wall just failed and collapsed and went down to the bottom of the ravine and uh, uh, just undermined. Broken. Yeah. He broke down into tears and Alan, he talked about that yesterday, commented that he, he just kept his mouth shut, but, um, yeah, sometimes, it, you know, the, the failures are an interesting part of the story, too. I know the guy who originally built the Salvation Mountain out by the Salton Sea, which is a great man-made mountain of tires and hay and <laughs> millions of gallons of acrylic paint. His first man-made mountain had likewise just collapsed. And you either learn from it or you don't, and you have friends help out. And I know Michael Rubel had a lot of friends with uh, architectural backgrounds who helped him build his five-story castle. Mm, five stories. Wow. Did you go up to that fifth floor? We did. Infamously, they have one of the most impressive clock towers. I believe it's one of only six mechanical clock towers in the world. That's really fascinating. Really? Uh, because mechanical clock towers, they have these gravity-driven bits. But by the time they were developed, I want to say in 1896, electrical components were beginning to come out. So they were almost immediately outmoded by the clock towers that superseded them. And Michael Rubel had looked for one of these for years and years and years and it's astounding they managed to find one and not only find it, but reconstruct it, uh, put it together and get it working. And it's, wow. it's at the top of one of the five-story towers. So we have to go up to that and then go down and see the actual mechanism driving it. It's just incredible. Oh, you did? Yeah. That's so really cool. If you or, or your listeners get a chance to, to take a tour of this place, it is astounding, really magical really a testament to what an eccentric artist can do. Yeah, it's on my list of places to go. And I had to ask you about the fifth floor because I wanted to know how safe it was. So <laughs> this, this seems to be very safe. Especially in earthquake country, right? You kind of 
get yeah. a little bit concerned about that. And and it sounds like it survived the Northridge quake, I think was our last biggest quake. I was just trying to think, was there a quake between then and now? But that was a pretty bad one. And so that's yeah. impressive. Well, there was that the quake in Chino Hills. Was that 2008, 2009? That earthquake would have been pretty close to the castle. And I believe that was a 5.9. That's a big one, yeah. But this definitely survived the 1994 Northridge earthquake with no damage to show for it. That's amazing. It's definitely on my bucket list. And I was going to ask you, I really must hear about when you met Angeline, the Billboard Queen. And was that for an article? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so this is really fascinating because uh, I, I've always tried to live a lifestyle where I have a new adventure every day. I jump at any opportunity to meet a new person, see a new thing. Anything eccentric and weird always piques my interest. But at this point in my life, uh, this was this was more than a few years ago. I wasn't really writing that much, and I had won a ride along with this woman named Angeline, who, if you're from Los Angeles, you (laughs) tend to know her as a woman who inexplicably put her image on dozens of billboards over the last 20, 30 years to no obvious ends. She's a very busty woman wearing very little uh, platinum blonde, and the billboard simply reads, Angeline. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it would give a phone number but no one was ever sure why. It didn't seem like she was trying to be a, an actress. And her pink Corvette, right? She yeah, had the pink Corvette. She was just known for driving around in her pink Corvette. And this, this iconic queen of pink was just famous for being famous. So here, 30 years after really her prime, uh, I, I had dropped my business card in this box that was covered with sequins that was announcing that you could win a ride along in this pink Corvette with Angeline. And I absolutely, you know, it's like, yeah, I'll drop a business card in there. And (laughs) sure enough, a few days later, I got called and notified that I'd won a ride along. Wow. And um, God, the day that unfolded was, uh, it was, it was an absolute mess. It turned out it was sort of a grift. Um, This woman really seems to, make her entire livelihood by kind of conning tourists out of money. Um, It felt more like a kidnapping. I was driven all over LA in her car while she tried to get me to buy her things, give her money. She took me to a grocery store, tried to get me to buy her groceries. Oh my gosh. And then like would kind of just shout at me, hurl insults uh, if I refused to buy things, shout things like, why are you so poor? Um, and she remember the first thing she said to me. Oh my god! Yeah, she stepped out of her car, and the first thing she said to me was, "Ew, your jeans are disgusting." And like oh they were god. freshly laundered jeans. <laughs> <We're fine. laughs> um, but I, I, I was left at a certain point. She had to stop and use the bathroom, and I had to call a friend to come pick me up and extricate me from the terrible situation. Oh and I was so distressed by what had happened, which, you know, now, what, six years later, it seems funny. But at the time, I, I was very agitated. Uh, and I wrote a fairly long article that I didn't really, it wasn't really intended to be read by anyone. I just wrote this article because I needed to do an emotional dump somewhere. Mm-hmm. And a, a friend had picked it up to put it on his website, and it ended up going viral. Consequently, I got to go on a lot of podcasts to talk about my terrible, we'll call it a date, <laughs> terrible date with Angeline. <laughs> uh, you know, I got contacted by strangers. She sounds so much like Anna Delvey, you know, the or Anna Sorokin, the Russian con artist, fraudster, scammer they just did a film on her i don't know if you saw it i have not seen that yet what i will say is now that i have some years between me and that event i feel like she's a she's a mentally ill woman and i i don't feel good that i wrote a lengthy article besmirching someone who is not well 
Uh, she's, she's spent her years trying to live up to this concept, this self-identity of an ingenue that's supported by the love of strangers because she's so adored. And uh, she kind of exists as a cautionary tale as to what L.A. can do to you in a pursuit of fame. That is crazy. And it's exactly what it sounded like when you <laughs> she told me she starts to yell, yell at you. And I immediately thought, wow, she sounds like she's mentally ill. Yeah, I'm starting to post some of my articles. It's still a a very nascent project, but the screwloose.com posts that article on winning a date with Angeline. So if anyone is curious to read about what that experience was with a few pictures, uh, you can find it on screwloose.com. Okay, I'll post that in the show notes. Uh, when a date with Angeline regret having been so flippant with the term garbage person in the past. The, what I thought was the funniest is uh, one of my best friends was waiting with me. It turned out we were having brunch right next door to where I needed to meet her. And uh, I had brunch with one of my best friends and his family. And they had a family friend who was visiting from Switzerland. And he came with me. I didn't include this in the article because I didn't want it force someone into the limelight but he came with me to meet her at the coffee shop and this was basically his first taste of america (laughs) was just (laughs) horrific experience and as far as i am sure he went back to switzerland and told everyone like yeah this is what america's like they have crazy pink women driving corvettes demanding money from strangers oh my goodness yeah, that's oh, there's a picture of you with her covering her face, hot pink magazine. Oh, that's funny. I like your red boots. Why, thank you. I was quite proud of those. She did not. <laughs> she did not. <laughs> she was not a fan. It's so funny. Even what you said, like, why are you so poor? That is one of the lines from, you know, from that Anna Delvey film uh she looks at the journalist who walks in and she says something like what are you wearing you look poor and that's funny and i like the hat with the little skull on there the cowboy hat yeah. Yeah, i have a, very cool. i have an adventure hat uh now i'm on my second one but i like to take little talismans that people give me from every adventure and it just goes on a hat my current one, the hat band, is a rattlesnake skin from the Rattlesnake Roundup. It still has a tail on it. The skulls are generally made for me by an assemblage artist named Ave Rose, who does incredible gilded skull art. It's really cool. Ooh. The teeth on that hat you can see in the photo are from wrestling alligators. They just, they lose teeth. So they're the shore of the lake. You can just pluck up these alligator teeth and stick them in your hat. Oh, wow. So no alligators were harmed in the making of this hat. No alligators were harmed in the making of this hat. Nope. Nice. Speaking of these skulls, so you were one of the performers at the Los Angeles Arboretum's Enchanted Garden Night. You read Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven for random strangers coming to listen to ghoulish bedtime stories. Yeah. Did you happen to go over to the ladies' booth that had all of the skulls? I did not make it over there. She's a longtime friend through the Burning Man scene. So I did not get a chance to take a long enough break to talk to Marcy about her skulls. Marcy Blaskin, I've been on a good number of ventures with her. She's fascinating. All of the stories that she was telling about how she got an animal and, you know, they're, they're all deceased. None of them were harmed in any way. They, they all died of natural causes. And she's so ethical about that, but just explaining the process. (laughs) She's got a cast iron constitution. That's for sure. (laughs) <laughs> that she does. That she does. Yeah. But she she had some cool animals over there. So when you were reading, now that you're saying you didn't get a break to head over there, were you just reading that story over and over? Or... It was just, just reading uh, The Raven over and over and over again. <laughs> it, was, it was fun. It was a little horse at the end of it. That was such a fun night. I love it. And I love that you were doing that. You did an excellent job. 
Well, thank you. <laughs> we, we were looking around for that lost Lenore. We thought she might be coming out and going, I'm here. <laughs> The other thing that you do, speaking of ghosts, is visit a lot of like occult places and uh, ghost towns around Los Angeles. Do you have a favorite one? There is a little town out, oh God, it's about four or five hours away. And really, I love everything in the Mojave. The Mojave Mm. is so spread out, but if you are an eccentric, you, you gravitate towards the desert and have these giant art displays but there's a maintained ghost town there is a giant crater known as the Amboy crater and right next to it is a tiny town of Amboy and Amboy is so cool it's got the like gooey architecture from the 50s fresh coat of paint on all these tiny little structures and Amboy is on the old route 66 which really, as soon as they opened Interstate 40, all the communities along Route 66 just instantly dried up and went away because they got no traffic. There was no one mm-hmm. coming through to feed the economy. But this little town has a wonderful dark sky site. So you can sit there, do astrophotography, stare up at the stars, watch meteor showers in a, a pretty eerie town with an abandoned church. It's uh, It has to be one of my favorite abandoned and lesser known spots in Southern California. Roy's Diner is there. Yeah. 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 I always pronounce it Amboy. So I was going, Amboy, where is that? Is that the correct pronunciation for it? Amboy? Honestly, I guess I don't know. Amboy, Amboy. Um, I I can't say I've heard a lot of people. It has a population of five and surprisingly not very talkative when you're there. So I usually get a hotel room in the town of Ludlow. Uh, You get a hotel room for $27 a night. Ludlow is not much larger than Amboy. Yeah. You know, the reason that Roy's Diner closed down is, or the whole town just kind of has never been built back up, is that crater has basically poisoned all the water. The water is so caustic, you can't drink it. Yeah. So they have no running water. It's just they can't get any. And they have the little gas station that's there adjacent to Roy's Diner. And you can get Route 66 root beer there. They actually have a post office. I bought postage stamps because I was there just before Christmas. And so that's a funny story because my dad, I, you know, probably have told this story a million times, but When my dad turned 73, he started riding his bicycle from Lomita, which is right next to Torrance, to Arizona to go visit his sisters solo. So um, my mom called me up and she was having this complete heart attack that my dad was going to do this crazy thing. And I needed to talk to him because he wasn't listening to anybody else. and. Then I get a call from my sister and she's like, I talked to dad and he's going to do this crazy thing and you really need to talk to him. So I'm like, all right, let me me go talk to him. And I asked him what his route was, where he was going to sleep. He knew everything down to how much his bicycle and he weighed together. He was going to leave early in the morning without any water in his water bags. And when he got to a place called Featherly Park in Riverside, it would be about the time where he'd want some water. And so that's when he would fill up. And then that way he was going out really light. He had everything he was going to wear, his entire route, you know, he was sitting in this beam of sunlight and put his hands over his heart, closed his eyes. And he said, I know every part of that route by heart. And I thought, I can't tell this guy, no, he can't go, you know, I mean, (laughs) God, you know, he looked like a boy scout just solemnly telling me that. So I just thought, you know, when I'm 73 years old, And I want to ride my bicycle across the desert in the fall when it's not blazing hot out there. 
I don't want somebody to tell me I can't do it. So I just told him, you know, just call me when you get to these different places. And one of the things he wanted to do was stop in Amboy and spend the night. And I said, you know, that's not open. It, it, you know, there's five people. Like you said, the population yeah. of the town is five people and that it's shut down. Well, he got from Lomita to Banning. He left like at 5 a.m. He got to Banning one, two o'clock in the afternoon. I just can't believe it, but he did. And so he goes, I think I can push on to Amboy. And I'm like, don't do it. Stay in Banning. Don't do it. <laughs> and the lady at one of the places that he stopped at knew the people who ran the gas station. And mm -hmm. they agreed to let him stay in one of the rooms there. Oh my God, that's so cool. I know, but it was basically a flop room. There was just a mattress on the floor and the guy told him, you know, you need to bring your bicycle into the room or it will not be here in the morning. And he's got this ridiculously expensive bike. Yeah. And then he said he couldn't get the windows shut and yeah. the wind was blowing and he said it was pretty much one of the most miserable nights he'd ever spent. And because he rode from banning directly to Amboy, you know, wanting to get there before dark. He didn't get dinner after riding, <laughs> I don't know oh, how many no. miles. So he yeah. didn't get dinner. He barely slept. He woke up in the morning and he had to get a can of soda out of the vending machine and a bag of chips. Yeah. And then he rode from there to Needles and had this giant pasta lunch. But he would do this trip all the time. So one of the last times that, uh, and I think it really was the last time that he went, he was about 78 at that time. And I said, you need to let me know when you're going to go. I'm going to get a crew of my friends together and we're going to film this and, you know, turn it into a documentary. Cause this is amazing. Like, you know, it's yeah. so inspiring. And he didn't let me know until he got to Arizona and he'd already been in Arizona for two days. I was at work and I was like, what? So I called Sophie. She was still in high school or I texted her. Do you want to go to Arizona and help me film this? And she said, yes. So I picked her up and just threw our cameras and our recording equipment into the car and off we went. I still need to put all the footage together. Sophie shot it. She'd never shot before. And so it's she got a lot of the car. <laughs> so yeah. I need to build up this documentary. But at the time, there had been some really heavy rains that had undermined a lot of the bridges on Route 66 through Wonder Valley. So there was about 33 miles of Route 66 that was closed off to through traffic. But there are still people who live in that area. So you could still get around those. You would drive around onto the sand. They created kind of like, a, you know, ran a steamroller so that you could kind of drive your car without sinking into the sand and then get back on the road. So coming back, there was nobody on 33 miles of Route 66, except for my dad on his bicycle and Sophie and I in our car and it was so post-apocalyptic feeling. And like you said, all of the creative people go out to the desert. There, you know, there's some really interesting abandoned buildings out there, but also there's a lot of just spontaneous art on yeah. the side of the road. And I think that's kind of what Route 66 yeah. is known for as well. So we would just stop and actually get out and be able to examine these random structures and, and sculptures and whatnot that some artists came out and created that you would normally just drive past. So it was pretty special. I know the like Elmer's Bottle Tree Ranch is out there where a guy's just built a bunch of, I mean, they're kind of just iron posts with hundreds of glass bottles it's mm -hmm. really magical it's on route 66 um there's also like the funny one is there's a bra tree i've heard of the bra tree I yeah you know people just go out there and hang a bra on the branches and there's like a bazillion of them on there 
I don't understand why, but it's pretty funny. You you literally have to stop and look at it, you know, so it's art. (laughs) That's really cool. There's so many things that I still want to talk to you about. Night Meets Uncredited Wizard University. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, there there was this fun thing, and I really like delving into the esoteric history of Los Angeles, but there was this fun little thing that was right next to my apartment, and it still is there. I just don't live there anymore. Uh, it's now <laughs> called the Philosophical Research Society, and it was started uh, in 1934 by this outspoken occultist named Manly P. Hall. And his idea was this would serve as sort of a a metaphysical library, a bastion of of esoteric knowledge, that the accumulated wisdom of mankind could live in this place and it would be unrestricted by the ideas of mainstream religions. So various Gnostic cult belief and all these religious ideals could be represented in the library of this institution. And consequently, to this day, they still have probably one of the world's most developed occult libraries. You can find Hmm. some really abstract texts there. But they would do these free uh, lectures every Tuesday night. Uh, It was a functioning university. And yes, uh, Manly Hall ran it right up until 1990, I want to say. And it, it officially was decreed a university in 2001. It was an accredited online university, in fact, offering graduate programs in consciousness studies and transformational psychology, which functionally meant it was a wizard university. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, this is unofficial, but I I do know it lost its accreditation uh, around 2019. And uh, for some reason, that struck me as really kind of funny. I, I hate to say it, but like, who accredits a wizard university? And and by what <laughs> vehicle do you lose said accreditation? At what point does whoever accredited you say, like, hmm, you were making good wizards before, but uh, wizards not so viable now. You need to really up your standards of wizardry, sir. The tricks and the curses and the spells have oh. really gone downhill. Very little defense from the dark arts. So, uh... Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the funny thing is, in California, there's this weird legal loophole that uh, fascinates and delights me. Uh, we allow Bible colleges in California. And what that means is there is no requirement for accreditation to confer a post-secondary degree, because if there were that requirement, then there'd have to be some sort of state accreditation program that could swing into these uh, Bible colleges and actually assess the veracity of their religious claims. And to be frank, that's not a good look. (laughs) You don't don't want the state coming in and and determining if a religion's true or false. So consequently, you don't need to be accredited. You can just confer PhDs by nature of announcing that you are a university. So this wizard university could have just gone about their business continuing to give PhDs, continuing to be a wizard university, but they didn't. When they lost their accreditation, they just changed their name to the Philosophical Research Society, and that both titillated and frustrated me. So uh, I, I looked into having my house declared a university. So now, by some technicalities, I reside at Night Meets Unaccredited Wizard University, And I now have a rigorous PhD program. The cost of enrollment is one burrito. So uh, last semester, Mm. we had 64 brave wizards who gave me a burrito and got a PhD in return in their chosen field of wizardry. So there's a bunch of doctor wizards around LA. Well, really all over America now because I I had a remote program so long as you somehow got me a burrito. Well, I will be sending in a burrito. I might even send you a couple. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. How many fields of study do you have? Uh, every single person. I, I, I had a very ridiculous uh, application program 
online form, and I constructed a unique field of study for every applicant. So no two people are doctors of the same type of wizardry, oh. which is really fun. And then a few people did seem to enroll non-ironically. And I hope to escalate this into something of a game. This will factor in scavenger hunts and future semesters and future years. Past graduates can be teachers in a very funzy, satirical game of wizardry. I bet there will be some really interesting and fun lectures <laughs> coming up soon. <laughs> uh, under the chandelier tree. At the, at night under the chandelier the tree. I like that. Yeah. Um, it's fun. And I've had a hard time differentiating trying to convince people that, no, this is not a Harry Potter thing. We're, we're a, a real school of fake magic. <laughs> it's funny how ingrained into our culture that is, because it's the only reference point that a lot of people have for something like this. You hear wizard and immediately you think Harry Potter. And I love that this is so far and different from the magic of that. Although I, I do love Harry Potter. It's much more interactive than the movies and, and the books. Yeah. And also it's an excuse for friends to gather and party in my backyard. We want to also incorporate this into a weekly meetup, which I guess makes us uh, technically a, a religious institution, where we go to a local diner and celebrate a <laughs> weekly Baconalia and eat bacon as wizards. Um. <laughs> Excellent. I love that. So if you had one thing to share with the world, what would it be? If I had one thing to share with the world, it would be the idea that you can leave your comfort bubble every single day of your life and benefit from that. You can grow through new experiences and there's not much of a downside. Unless it's Angeline. Unless it's Angeline. <laughs> That's awesome. And if anybody wanted to get a hold of you to talk about your photography, the image tech side, or anything else that you've talked about, how can they get a hold of you? What's the best way? Uh, I would say look me up. Honestly, it's such a hot medium right now. Uh, look me up on Instagram, Phil underscore Warren. You can also contact me through my website at philwarrenphotography.com. But honestly, slide into my DMs on the IG. Wizardry, Baconalia, UFOs. <laughs> what an adventurous life. I really hope that we encouraged you to explore more of the world around you, especially if you live in Los Angeles. We are so lucky to have so much diversity of locations and places to wander to within just very short driving distances of us. Check out the show notes for links to everything we talked about and take a moment to rate this episode because your rating really does help move this podcast closer to the top of searches so that my friends and I can reach more people. I'm looking forward to sharing more upcoming In the Company of Friends talks with you. So be sure to follow me on the socials and the dot com all at the Queen Trow Podcast. That's T H E Q U A I N T R E L L E Podcast. I am Sil Annan, the Queen Trow, and until next time, I wish you passion, grace, adventure, curiosity, magic, elegance, and beauty.